Good afternoon everybody, welcome to Abdominal Medicines and Surgery's very first report out. This is a rapid, rapid process improvement workshop looking at clinical checkpoints in TURP patients. Hello, my name is Chris, I'm the workshop leader for this event. The team have worked really hard this week, learning new skills, techniques and disciplines, especially in respect, respect for time. So we're going to report back to you in 15 minutes and then we'll take some questions afterwards. This is our project form which gave us our start point for this week. This shows the amount of variation involved in the TURP discharge pathway, particularly around paperwork, clinical process and the trial without catheter. I'm going to let the team explain to you all about what they've been doing this week. So we started with a high level value stream map and looking at TURP patients. So we started with six process boxes. We started with patient in recovery, patient arrives on the ward, clinical review, decision to discharge, EDAN and patient discharge and we refined this down so the RPIW was looking at clinical review. We have to determine what our tack time is and it's about pace and demand. So and what we found and when we looked at how many patients went through, it was about 26 a month. So there's one patient and theatre time is over 8 hours. So our tack time is 480 minutes. We have to know how we're going to measure and what our progress is. So we need to look at a target progress report. And we started with a baseline and we looked at six key elements. The first element is about staff walking. So we looked at the clinical support worker and the nurse in admitting the patient. And the clinical support worker walked 319 steps and the nurse walked 99. In relation to steps for changing an irrigation bag, um, it was 83 steps and we set a target of reducing those steps of 50%. The lead time, and this was really interesting, so this is about the full process of a patient. If a patient goes through Jeffrey Giles, it's 39 hours, 58 minutes, and if they go through David Beavers having a TURP, it's 19 hours, 4 minutes. And we were set a stretch target by our sponsors of 50% of TUR patients suitable to go through in 6 hours. We talk about work in progress and what's actually in the system and there were two patients going through the Jeffrey Giles pathway and one um, through David Beavers and the standard work in progress, um, so it should be shown about whether there's variation, it was two in Jeffrey Giles and David Beavers and our target is there's one so you've got continuous flow. When you look at quality we look at it in relation to defects and a message that came really clear from the home team and all the ideas was about the bladder scanner. Every time they went for it, it wasn't there. So we measured it at the start and it was missing three out of four times I went for it. So there's a defect rate of 75% and we aim for zero defects. That's the only thing we accept. And when we look at environmental health and safety, we look at bladder scanner location, but we 5S it. And we always start at level one, but our target was for level four. Hello, my name is Becky, I'm sister on J42 and co-process owner for this RPIW. The current state clinical review focused on the meet and greet of the patients, the initial observations, documentations, clinical review and ward round, the update and patient plan and bladder irrigation review as well to stop. This clinical review has lots of variations as you can see from the number of Kaizen bursts around the side. These variations include location and variation of paperwork, variation handover documentation, variation in system data, variation in practice and plan for TWOC, variation in patient analgesia, variation in patient information, variation in different surgeon and post-operative instructions, variation in bladder scanner availability on the ward. A large number of the Kaizen bursts focus on irrigation and the interpretation of the urine colour. This particular um, slide, we asked three different members of the team, CSW, FY1 and nurse, what colour would you say this um, urine was and we got clear with a tinge of blood, light rosé, rosé and fruity. <laughs> we also found a variation in staff knowledge and confidence around caring for post TURP patients. Hello, my name is Eileen, I'm sister on J43 and co press owner for this RPIW. At the start of the week we had to agree on the focus of the workshop with the RPIWT agreed with the findings of the value stream map. Using ideas forms, we generated 52 ideas on the first day and reviewed the home team generation map. The consensus of the group was to focus on the following. One, the variation in staff knowledge of the procedure and post-op care. 
Two, the variation in post open structures and how ward staff interpreted these. Three, the amount of paperwork that each patient that comes to the ward generates and the time to complete this was found to be significant. Some of the documentation was thought not fit for a potential short stay surgical patient. A dedicated TERP pathway booklet was agreed with checkpoints for discharge. The lack of irrigation chart was brought up by all RPRW members and this was agreed to be devised and implemented. It was highlighted by the home teams that equipment was in various places on the wards and the plant scanner was constantly missing when needed. We would focus on eliminating waste in this area. And finally, we have to have a process in place if patients are to be discharged early and this has to be robust to save discharge. Hello, I'm Nigel, I'm charge nurse and David Beavis Day Unit and a member of the RPIW team. It was identified on the target progress report that the Ward 43 bladder scanner was missing 75% of the time. This obviously affects patients' care and discharge time. The standard worksheet also identified an environmental health and safety issue as it identified nursing staff who had covered a significant distance and having to enter multiple rooms to collect equipment for post-op urology care. By using the five S's, we identified an area where urology equipment and bladder scanner could be stored safely and securely. By sorting, we identified an area and removed the necessary clutter. By simplifying, all items were placed in one area. By sweeping the unit, we identified items that were missing and planned to move them to those chosen location. By standardising, by standardising we identified that no standards were set for either bladder scanner usage or loaning to other areas, and this has been remedied. And by self-discipline, we identified that no work checks were actually being done on the scanner at the moment. Hello, my name is Anne Marie and I'm a CSW on J43. I'm a member of the RPIW team. The evidence and changes that we have observed and put into place for the bladder scanner are a clear standard of work for J43, also a clear standard of work for loan of the bladder scanner to other wards. We have also identified a clear reduction in steps done by the nursing staff from 83 steps to 52 steps. This has been achieved by ensuring all necessary equipment is stored and located in one area on the GAMBA. Hello, my name is Seb and staff nurse on J43 and a team member of the RPIW. Um, from the post-op plan, this starts from the recovery and the assumption is that the surgeon who performs the procedure will be absolutely clear about their plan regarding inclusion of suitable patients to follow the six, six hour rapid uh, pathway, of which a template has been designed to go with that one. Uh, on arrival on, on the ward, the staff will introduce themselves to the patient and reinforce the plan and also clarify any concerns patients may have. We have um, identified from the variations that there have been a lot of variation in our documentation and as part of the challenge we set up to really standardize a single document which will incorporate and that will be ideal for our patients which we have literally produced a document like that which has got all the uh, safety checkpoints uh, to guide the patient pathway through. The patient on uh, will be fed, will be encouraged to mobilize and to continue to monitor their irrigation for a minimum of four hours by which a decision will be made to stop the irrigation. And by the six hours time, if the patient has really satisfied all the safety checks, then they will be ready to be on their way home. However, those that will not satisfy that criteria will move on to a different pathway, which will be a 23-hour pathway. Um, and if patients are going home, obviously we would have taught them the catheter cares, the supplies and everything that will go with it. Um, the other thing that um, we really found also was the fact that if we are able to get the patient home within the six hours time, uh, that would be great. If we have not, this, and they go home within the 23 hours time, we will be able to significantly reduce our current practice. And that is something that we are looking up to do. Lastly, the variation in staff knowledge was a key um, worry for us. And one of our strategies to do is to develop continuous educational program 
for the various tapping groups that we have to continue to update them on the technology we are using. Hello, uh, my name's Steve, I'm the urologist of the RPIW uh, team and we were challenged to, with the development of a simplified process uh, to allow safe early discharge of patients following TURP surgery. We were asked to concentrate on the period uh, from the patient entering uh, recovery uh, to discharge home. Uh, now currently 80% of patients are inpatients uh, and as you heard the lead time for these patients is 39 hours. Uh, no pressure, we were challenged by our sponsors uh, to get 50% of suitable patients home uh, within six hours. So, um, who might be suitable for that? Uh, well, we thought there might be some absolutes for that. We thought for six hour discharge, the patient should be fit, ambulant, and have support at home. Those would have to be a given. Uh, and beyond that, we'd want patients who were not at risk of prolonged bleeding or sepsis. So we'd exclude patients who had a catheter preoperatively, <coughs> patients who've got a history of urinary tract infection or current urinary uh, tract infections, and patients with very large uh, prostates. Um, however, we felt that nearly everybody from the remainder, apart from those who might need bridging therapy, for instance, uh, might be dischargeable within 23 hours with a catheter. Uh, the practicalities of this new approach would require that a lot more of the post-operative responsibilities for assessment might be placed on the shoulder of nurses uh, than there is at the present. And this would require clear documentation from theatre, standardised operation notes, the completion of an EDAN, uh, and the start of completion of a standard pathway document from theatre and recovery. However, although it wasn't part of our remit, we recognised that the earlier stages in the pathway were really important uh, in terms of preparing patients, assessing suitable patients for, the, for rapid discharge, and for uh, counselling patients that this might be their approach. So what happens currently? These are, these are, this is a review of the current uh, operation notes from patients having TRP surgery uh, in this hospital. And you can see that there's wide variation in the instructions to irrigate and also in the post-operative trial without catheter instructions. So, we need standardised operation notes for those patients on a six hour pathway and those on a 23 hour pathway. And it would be the duty of the surgeon in theatre uh, to, to ensure that the patient was started uh, on the correct pathway. And we, we would make clear in that document what was to happen next. The big worry of the staff caring for the patients on the ward has been uh, the review of irrigation, the decision as to whether or not uh, the patient needs continued irrigation or not, and whether or not they're, when they're suitable for trial without catheter, recording of information about bleeding is really very difficult. As you saw, there was wide variation in what people called hematuria. And so we thought we'd simplify the chart because at the moment we're having to use the, the, the trust's fluid balance chart, which is not fit for purpose. Um, so what we thought was we'd number the irrigation bags sequentially from one onwards and that you'd simply mark against time in column one uh, the number of the bag that was being put up and the time it was put up. Uh, and then output could be recorded in the next two columns, the colour of the urine from a visual chart, the colour in the tube draining the catheter uh, recorded in this column and any comments such as the patient needing a bladder washout or there being clots present etc in the final column. There's also another box on this form, which should be started in theatre, which records the preoperative haemoglobin of the patient, their sodium level, their creatinine, the whether or not they had a catheter or not, whether or not they've been on anticoagulants, and whether or not uh, they were likely to have infected urine. And that would mean that anybody reviewing the patient could look at one page and get all the essential uh, information. So, what about the real world? Well, uh, we took the top 20 patients off the urology waiting list for TURP, 51 patients on the list, and the top 20 patients ranged significantly in age. 12 out of 20 lived at home with a relative, 
10 out of 20 had a preoperative or have a preoperative catheter. Two out of 10 have a history of urinary tract infection. One out of 10 have had a history of urosepsis related to a catheter change. Uh, and eight out of the 20 had a prostate volume assessment uh, from, from clinic. And two of those had a very large prostate. So 25% of patients have uh, prostates more than 100 mils uh, in volume. Uh, two out of 20 have obstructive sleep apnea and will require a monitored overnight bed. Nine out of 20 are either on antiplatelet agents or uh, anticoagulants. None of them would essentially require bridging. Oops, like that. Um, and 10 out of 20 had sig significant comorbidities. So if we looked, we applied those to, to the uh, six hour uh, discharge, all of them independently caring, 12 out of 20 someone at home, and 10 out of 20 no major comorbidity which would prevent you uh, sending them home at six hours. That would allow nine patients onto a six hour pathway. And if you applied the, the preoperative catheter rule, the prostate size rule, and the history of urinary tract infection rule, you're down to three patients. So in the real world, three patients will be, we think will be potentially absolutely safe uh, to, uh, to go on a six hour uh, pathway. Um, as you got more confident, maybe we could expand that to more patients, but we felt that all the patients uh, on the, the waiting list looked at will be, uh, could be dischargeable at 23 hours, and that will be a significant improvement from the present. Thank you very much. Okay, so we showed you the value stream map earlier, and this is our clinical review. And from the home team and what staff identified and through observations, these were all the variations in practice, and you can see through all the work that they've done this week and the achievements, how much of the variation that we've actually taken out of the system. We've done that by remeasuring, um, and we've used the standard work and the standard work observation forms to actually remeasure some of the processes, and this is our result. So this is from one week's RPIW. So the staff walking distance, we looked at the CSW and the nurse, they have remeasured and the nurse has dropped from 99 steps to 48, which is a 50% reduction. When they looked at the irrigation bag, by doing the 5S, the nurse used to walk 83 steps to collect her equipment. She now works 52, which is a 35% reduction. We looked at lead times and we looked through patients going through Jeffrey Giles, so this wasn't David Beavers. Unfortunately, we didn't have patients that we could follow through um, actually on day, but we did patients that had been done the previous day, so we applied all the criteria. The first measure was 23 hours, so applying the criteria and the measures that we've done is the patient could have gone home in 23 hours. However, when we've refined it during the rest of the week and looked at it, is the patient would have gone home in 15 hours compared to a 39 hour lead time previously. Um, in relation to work in progress, you can see throughout the week where the patients were. So we did have two on day three, um, but unfortunately not, nobody on day four or the final day. Um, in relation to defects, um, the team applied the 5S and they were looking at the bladder scanner location. And when the first went down, we had a 100% defect, it wasn't there. So they applied the 5S principles with the locations, and on the second two measurements, it was there every time they went down. So the defect in the week has gone down to 0%. 5S has a, a grid, and we always start on level one. And, you know, they've made significant achievements. So day three, they were on level two, which is a really big achievement paper um, which we're going to take away for the 30, 60 and 90 day report out um, and as you can see it identifies a problem, an action needed to be completed, a responsibility and when that action should be completed. Other ideas have been generated and these have been sent to the parking lot for now for consideration by the sponsors and were thought to be important but without out of the scope of this week. So what have we learned this week then? So <coughs> our key learnings are we all have mental values to overcome Taking time out as a multidisciplinary team really does pay different, make a difference. Um, we all have to walk in the patient's shoes and see the patient journey. Um, we all work in silos and we need to work together better. Uh, we have to challenge the status quo and as Toyota would always say, there's always a better way. 
got some thank yous. So I just want to thank Chris Johnston, who has been with us all week, but unfortunately can't be with us today. So thanks to Chris for coming along and helping us. Uh, the home team on David Beavers, J42 and J43. Emma Wright, our clinical educator, who has been helping us with the discharge booklet. Medical physics and their help tracking the bladder scanner. And Rosemary King, from coming over from Virginia Mason to work with us. Thank you very much. The team have worked extremely hard this week. I am just going to invite sponsors up to see if they've got any comments for us first. Alright. <laughs> Afternoon. Uh, I'm Ollie Kays, I'm a urologist. I'm sponsored for the event along with, with Penny McSorley. Um, <coughs> I think what we've seen so far, just in this short 15 minutes, is the incredible amount of work six or seven members of our trust at various levels of experience, various different jobs, can come together, dropped into it. They weren't prepared, they didn't give any pre-week uh, information, and challenged on Monday morning to come and work on this idea. And I think what we've seen is that we set them a task, and to achieve that excellence, they've gone beyond that. Individually and as a group, they've blended and shared their experiences and actually come up with something that I think is really plausible for us coming down to working towards those targets of a six hour um, discharge planning. And we really focused on one area of, of, of the patient journey. And I think this is going to blend nicely with the other work we're doing at the front end, looking at technology and things that we can do to treat more patients, looking at decreasing bleeding times and using that technology to then fast throughput through these, um, this pathway so that these patients can actually get out of hospital quicker and have better outcomes. So I applaud them for their effort. I hope they've had a really good time and enjoyed it. I think it'd be good to speak to everybody individually and see how intense this week's actually been. Uh, but I think it's also been fun. I think it's been a real learning experience. And also I'd like to thank the team. So you can't do what these guys have been doing without the experience of the KPO. It's been a new experience for all of us. Um, and I, you know, I'd like to thank Chris and the team for guiding uh, and for the, the Seattle-based members coming over and showing us what we need to do because, again, to get to this point within five days, and I think you said it, Chris, did you handpick the team? I don't think we need to handpick the team because we've got more people just as good at this mm -hmm. who can come and do it. I'd just like to say um, a big thanks to the team and they have worked incredibly hard. Um, Ollie and I have been the sponsors but I think it's really important to say we've had very little to do with the process this week. We've literally just touched base with them probably once a day, not even once a day to see how they're getting on and I think it's a really good example of change led by the clinical team by people that do this every single day. <coughs> I think sometimes at management we can make a lot of assumptions about what happens at the patient level and we can think we know what happens at the patient level and I think these guys are working in it every day and can make really clinically based change and I think that's what we've seen this week. We've got lots and lots of more ideas, um, we've got different work streams happening um, and we've got report outs at 60 days and 90 days and I'm really looking forward to seeing the progress that this team is going to make. I'm the executive sponsor for Value Stream 2 and um, I'd just like to say wow <laughs> because um, I think that you have achieved so much and um, we had the privilege of joining the team briefly on Wednesday and when we walked into the room the energy and passion in the room was um, fantastic all the work around the walls which um, we haven't been able to transport down here today but um, th they have, as Ollie and Penny have said, made fantastic progress over the week and I can't believe how they have managed to get so quickly into the language um, of improvement and, and lean methodology Becky is an expert on tact time <laughs> and, um, and um, and so I think they have done amazingly well. I also want to acknowledge um, Chris and Helen and, and, and Helen, um, <laughs> our KPO team, and I don't know if Jimmy and it's, Sophie is not here, here in the room. And so um, it's been a very important week for them. But um, thank you all for the support. Thanks for coming today to listen to what the team have achieved.